theocratic, aristocratic, democratic, again chaotic. What are these names actually? What do they signify? You know, the first three, theocratic, aristocratic and democratic, these are the ages of, you know, division of human history according to the great humanist Jim Battista Vico of the 18th century. Now, uh, it's roughly approximate to our division of history into ancient, medieval, modern. Theocratic is the ancient part and then aristocratic is the medieval part and then democratic is the modern part. To this, Harold Bloom adds the fourth one, the chaotic. In Vico, it was neo-theocratic age. A neo-theocratic age was to come and for, you know, Harold Bloom is chaotic. Now, these are the divisions into which he divides the history of literature of Europe in particular and the entire world, it is though a bit preposterous in general. So, 1994 saw the publication of Harold Bloom's huge, you know, highly influential book, The Western Canon, in which Bloom again made a strong case for sticking to the original quote-unquote great authors of the Western tradition, which all kinds of critics from, you know, our uh, race studies, Afro-American critics, post-colonial critics, Marxist critics, all these have found problems with the so-called great authors. That, but, but, but then Bloom says, no, they're really great. Why? Because they're aesthetically great. Now, aesthetics is precisely the point over which these other kind of schools, you know, disagree with the likes of Bloom. How can you how can you qualify what is aesthetic? What are the parameters? What are the rubrics under which aesthetic can be qualified? We say beauty, truth, and all these varieties are there. Uh, but then Bloom doesn't say so. He says aesthetic experience or aesthetic feeling or aesthetic expression is something which is there innate, you know, in people who know it and cannot be shared with people who do not know it. My God, that is again a very problematic statement. It rather justifies the opposition of this political criticism to the quote-unquote Western canon. Now, Bloom, in his counter-opposition, we can say, calls all these critical schools and theoretical schools schools of resentment, that they know only what to complain, but then our great tradition of Western literature is going astray and which which has a great possibility of reviving sustaining humanity to a great extent i believe what bloom says but at the same time i believe with the other schools also you know that there are other things there jane austen colonialism is there you cannot you know undermine it you cannot avoid reading it especially after post-colonialism in dickens racism is there but Bloom, you know, turns a deaf ear to these other things. And then he more or less arbitrary, I won't say arbitrarily, but selectively, primarily he chooses 10 authors who, according to him, are the great writers of the Western canon. And then, quite predictably, there is, there is not a single, you know, uh, you know, woman author, let alone transgender or other kinds of authors. So these are all, you know, male, male authors like Shakespeare, Wordsworth, you know, Cervantes, you know, Chaucer. And then there is an extended list which includes around 26 authors. So they are the great authors. Now, how do you choose what is great? It is a continuation. Bloom's methodology is a continuation of Arnold's touchstone method. But whereas Arnold referred more to figures like, say, Homer, Virgil of classical antiquity, for Bloom, Shakespeare is the center of the canon. In fact, um, after the introduction and elegy for the canon, the, the very first, you know, chapter is basically, I'll just, yeah, the very first chapter, the theocratic, sorry, under the aristocratic age is Shakespeare, center of the canon. It is also again Arnoldian. As Arnold said in that poem to Shakespeare, others abide our questions, thou art free. 
that Shakespeare cannot be questioned. Yes, I do admit that Shakespeare, in his felicity of expression, he, he outnumbers quite a few of what I have read, but I won't say all, unlike Bloom, because there are many literatures in many languages which I haven't read. African literatures I have read, you know, in English translation. So same with Arabic. So how can I say that Shakespeare, you know, is better than all that, that have been expressed? But yes, he is one of the best. And then for me, more importantly, Shakespeare is significant for his political awareness, something which Bloom does not choose to talk about or speak about. He, I will give an instance from The Tempest, his, arguably his last play published in 1611. I have also spoken about Tempest earlier. Now, in that Tempest, for example, in 1611, remember, then colonialism or colonization had hardly started because it was, you know, on 31st December of 1599 that East India Company had got the charter to do trade in the East. But within 11 years of that, you know, we find Shakespeare writing an allegory of colonization in the Tempest and not only that, he gives voice to also resistance to colonialism or colonization through the wars of Caliban, which would follow in the colonies much, much later, say in the 19th century. So we find, for example, Caliban uh, saying that, you taught me language, my profit on it is I know how to curse. So, so that is Shakespeare's, you know, intelligence, prophetic intelligence, in a way, you can say. But anyway, there is some, some saving, uh, you know, grace, so far as we are concerned, the non-Westerns are concerned, you know, in Bloom's Western canon also. Towards the end of the book, as appendix says, he gives a list of books that can be read and should be read and there he includes works from other parts of the world also minimally though so in the theocratic age from india he recommends the ramayana the mahabharata and the gita which is of course a part of the mahabharata and he knows that he has mentioned that in that age so there must so we are you know rather happy to see this but this thing would not have been there had the so-called school of resentment not been in place Though Bloom has tried to disparagingly dismiss those, but some some kind of inroads this school has made into him, so that we have Tony Morrison also, for example, in that extended list, not not in the major authors list whom he chooses to discuss inside the text, but some appendix. So at least some accommodation is there, and then we want more. But then it shows that inroads have been made into the so-called. Western canon. Because finally, if we have to have any canon at all, and I think we should have because otherwise things are practically difficult, then it should be neither Eastern nor Western, but maybe humanist canon. Or now humanism with, you know, eco-consciousness, which is all the more important. Now, these three texts are chosen for the theocratic age. In the, in the aristocratic age, I don't see any reflection of any text from India, but we have we have had abundant of literature, at least Kalidasho, who who had been highly praised by people like even Goethe, who for uh, Bloom is a canonical figure, but I don't find. But then again, in the democratic age, sorry, you know, modern age, we you no know, in the democratic also actually we we don't have you know any inclusion from India and. V v the last age that Bloom includes in his uh, long list is that very controversial, the chaotic age. That is what we call the modern age, say from the 60s onwards. So I would just, just like to read, though he has included it, but that comes with the rider that, so far as the chaotic age is concerned, not all of the works here can prove to be canonical, he says. So, I have included them, but they are not canonical. They are not going to last long, he says. What I have omitted, you know, uh, anyway, it's there that he says I have not included them again on the basis of cultural politics. But I say that he has due to the effect of this so-called school of resentment. But 
he says that some of this will soon be thrown away by the people of those countries only and here again from india you know there are again three texts have been allotted arkan arayan's the guide a good text salman ras this midnight children and ruth power jawala's heat and dust so all these the names you know they are more more suggestive of something else some orientalism of side actually there are many other things a eh? tagore for instance prominent was at one point of time prominent in the west and also tagore is not included nor aurobindo but then you know from chaotic age these two figures and obviously salman rushdi you know has to be a pop- has to be popular with a eurocentric person like bloom for a uh, certain other reasons which i don't want to spell out what everyone knows so more or less you know this is a very interesting thing again the name of the book is the western canon a year before the western canon it was published in 1994 in 1993 we have a strong counter canonical book culture and imperialism by said their side say that what to read and how to read is the full form of the question so partially bloom's book answers the first part of course from his point of view what to read and then taking shakespeare as the center of the canon there are 10 major european authors and then by extension all these that he includes willy nilly they are there but then how to read it he doesn't answer except from that quote unquote aesthetic point of view now uh of course we can see that the western canon itself is again a case of cultural imperialism of the west but not all people in the west are like bloom you know there are friends there are sympathizers and there are people who appreciate our culture so they are in a way you know greater humanists but to a great extent as i said in the beginning i more or less agree with bloom's selection from the from the western canon but conrad is again not there though it was included by bloom's formidable predecessor fr lewis also i mean it he was included uh, texts of conrad was included by fr lewis in his the great tradition bloom leaves him out so all these things you know are there and maybe at some point of time you can try to read the western canon as an aesthetic experience as a work of quote unquote literary criticism pure this is obviously a, you know an excellent work and at least shakespeare at the center of the canon that chapter should be read and then again freud's freud a shakespearean reading there is another chapter now i also like shakespeare if others are not read and but then but then the thing is what is more important from my point of view what bloom would obviously call the school of resentment is we have to also look at what bloom leaves out more than what he includes thank you